Before we get underway, I'm really excited. Uh, we have a number of folks, a couple hundred folks, I think, joining us today. So we're going to try to get your questions. Quick explain about what we're doing. Uh, you may have been with us back in August. Trey Bean Shorters, who's the CEO of the Be Me community, joined us uh, for the first of these in conversations. This is a new thing that we're trying to do. Uh, we've learned a little bit of our conf at our conference over the last couple of years and, and understand that conversations are often a really great way to surface information you wouldn't get otherwise. And particularly for those of us who have a very specific task in front of us, we're doing communications for good, we're working at foundations or nonprofits. So our work's maybe a little different than that of a journalist, but there's a lot of things that we could learn. Uh, so over the course of the next hour, Alexis and I are going to have a chat. Uh, and during the course of that chat, we're going to invite all of you to pitch in uh, with a question. Uh, or a comment, hopefully more questions than comments. I, I, I think that's the aim here. But at the end of the hour, the goal is we all get a little bit smarter, and we have the luxury of sitting with one of the preeminent journalists in Washington. We're going to talk a little bit about writing and crafting stories, and then I think at some point our conversation is going to pivot. We're going to talk a little bit about the environment for journalists here in Washington, D.C., and the environment for journalists in the economy at large, because that's kind of changing a little bit. Um, for those of you who don't know Alexis, and my guess is maybe uh, that's a very few of you, because chances are you have seen her. She's been on PBS's Washington Week. You've heard her voice on NPR. Her political commentary appears on there, or her analysis from time to time. And you've probably read her, uh, maybe without even realizing you were doing so, uh, through Real Clear Politics or through National Journal, where she was for many, many years. So thank you very much. Uh, Alexis Simmendinger for being with us. Thank you. Happy Halloween to you. Happy Halloween. Oh, wait a minute. I think we can maybe save this for later. I've got some M&Ms for do you. Do you have a trick I for do. us? No trick. No trick. I was going to come with a treat, but actually it may turn out this is a trick because I think the treat I put down elsewhere. Uh-oh. Anyway, so let's, I will get you a treat though, I promise. <laughs> uh, why don't we start with a pretty broad question. You, know, you can kind of come at this any way you please. But uh, we had a conversation with Michelle Norris, your old colleague, yes. in Miami just a few weeks ago. And as we closed that conversation, she said something really interesting. Uh, she said, you know, God gives you two of these pointing at her ears and one of these pointing at her mouth. And she said, that probably means we need to spend a lot of time listening. Now, you're a professional journalist. Uh, you talk to any reporter in Washington and you say Alexis Simmendinger and they all smile and sigh with this great, great air of satisfaction. You're the pro's pro. You have a wonderful reputation here. And I think part of it is, uh, one of the things I've asked people is that they say she's a tremendous listener. So I guess the question is, what is listening? How do you do it and what does it mean to you? Well, that's a great question because in Washington, we know that uh, the population here loves to talk. So you have, as a journalist here, you have ample opportunities to listen. And one of the things that I've learned over the years as a journalist is that there are certain recurring elements of storytelling and so uh, you have to listen carefully for the, what is new because there are certain themes that recur. So it's kind of a, a, a skill that you hone over time to listen for what is the new and the news and then try to use your listening power to sort through uh, as much as you can what are all the indicators that are going in to what it is that makes you think that's new and what questions would be appropriate to explore what it is that someone is saying. Not confrontationally, but sometimes you have to do that. Uh, in other words, you're putting up a set of facts or uh, as a longtime White House correspondent where talking is a, you know theater, right, and especially is right now with Donald Trump, you have to also use the skill of coming equipped with information. So it's it's uh, asking someone to expand on what you've heard them say, but also what you've heard other people say, or what you've heard uh, other uh, assorted sources suggest to you in order to sort out what is new and why uh, it might be important to the audience that you're trying to reach. And when you walk into the room with a reporter's notebook yeah. and you start scribbling, my guess is you're not just taking notes on the words that are being said. You're also making observations, body language, what's happening in the room, the decor, the, the ego wall, who's in it. Uh, and, and ego wall is maybe a term of art here in Washington. And for those who, who have the great good fortune not have to, to see this on a regular basis, many people in D.C. will have on their office wall a picture of them with the grand poobah of whatever. Uh, that, that's, that's that phrase. Um, talk to me about how, when you walk into that room, you do listening that doesn't involve words. 
Well, in the time that I've been a correspondent, I sur I've covered Congress, I've covered agencies and departments, I've covered the White House. I've certainly covered events, like for instance 9-11, where your power of observation was uh, you know, something that you had to actually control because the whole city was in a state in the grip of uh, literally terrorism. Uh, and, and I've certainly have covered things that are just entertaining and fun and you have to use your power of uh, observation in different ways too. I'll give you an example of a couple of things. Uh, as a journalist, what's really fun is when you're going to talk to someone and you get access to their inner sanctum, whatever it is. I can remember some of the most fun conversations that are also revealing about the subject that you're talking to, not just personally, but also what makes them tick, by getting a chance to see them in their world, the world that they occupy. And if you get a chance to do that, what you're trying to do is string it out and stay there for a period of time and get them to give you the tour. And, and oftentimes in Washington, people are self-focused enough that they are very eager to do that, whether it's their office or uh, their, the floor of the Senate or um, some element of what it is they're doing. In the White House, for instance, you get to be a pool reporter, mm -hmm. and over the years of being a pool reporter, you're trying to be the eyes and ears for your colleagues in a, in a very short amount of time. And you really hone your powers of observation quickly so that your eyes and your ears are trying to pick up not just what your tape recorder but oftentimes what you don't have the time to write down on that pad of paper. And um, so I've tried to put into pool reports things that very rapidly that I can see. And I'll be as detailed as I can be. And my colleagues have said that they've appreciated who's in the room, what they were doing when they were in the room, who was talking to whom in the room, why were they hanging back in the room, why was the chief of staff to the President of the United States running into the room tucking his shirt into his <laughs> right or right or whatever. So uh, uh, I can remember interviewing um, senators, and um, a, a particular senator who I won't name wanted to tell me with extensive excruciating detail how his wife had helped him decorate the office and what he had done and how much he had spent, and why he was so proud of the redecoration of his office. <laughs> this is a recurring theme. So wherever you are, whether it's 9/11, if it's a national uh, disaster, if it's a uh, presidential speech, you have to use your your eyes almost like they're cameras. So for a lot of folks in the network, they work alongside executives, program staff, whatever it might be at foundations and nonprofits. It seems to me that there's a little bit of an analog here. They're talking oftentimes and, and trying to make sense of the work that their colleagues are doing and trying to deliver with a little bit more crispness and clarity, um, uh, maybe with some some more cogent sort of understanding of what the work is or adding some element to it so it's, it's more available to folks outside of the organization. But they talk to these folks over and over and over again. You, when you covered the White House, are obviously talking to, for a period of time anyway, the same people over and over again. How do you keep it fresh? How do you ensure that you're both developing a relationship and a rapport, but also able to, to mine those, those conversations for, for useful bits of information for the new? Well, one of the things that has been interesting about covering uh, the White House versus, say, covering Congress and, uh, is, and, and maybe a lot of people know this, but my observation over covering um, five presidents is that more than any other part of Washington or our um, democratic institutions, one single person shapes the nature, the tenor, and the tone of the executive branch, and that's the President of the United States. So for good or ill, the talents and the vulnerabilities, the, the, the deficits or the strengths of one human being. So keeping it fresh is actually not that hard because each president is so distinctive and different and each president has brought in uh, a variety of, of folks to help through an ever-changing menu of issues. Nothing stays the same and everything today in the modern presidency w walks through somehow in one way or another the White House. And if you've covered the White House for a long period of time, what you do learn is that a president goes through cycles. So even though you may say we have a president for eight years, mm -hmm. the cycles of their learning and the folks that they bring in and the issues that they have to reckon with uh, also are reflected in the turnover of their teams. So it isn't that hard to keep it fresh because the range of issues are often so varied and the 
characters who come in mm-hmm. i'll give you an example uh, most presidents in their first year that i've covered have had rocky first years for one reason or another the first year tends to be a, a year of learning and ad- adaptation and they are trying to figure out to get their their la- you know their land legs um, and they oftentimes will change out their staff. They'll change, sometimes events will change the direction of their agendas. So for instance, uh, Barack Obama who inherited a financial crisis, a George W. Bush who dealt with 9-11, um, a Bill Clinton who thought he knew everything about Washington and came in and found that dealing with Democratic majorities in the House and Senate was not really the gift that he thought. And he plowed into health care, you know, ended up saying uh, don't ask, don't tell was a complete mess you know, he had to recalibrate. So I have found in Washington, uh, and especially if you cover Capitol Hill, you can see this, that (coughs) the change is the constant and the keeping it fresh is not the problem. (laughs) It's not the problem. But for those folks that, surely, because you've been in this town and you've covered this town for such a long time, you have source reporter relationships that go back years. Yes. Right? How do you... I guess, well, among other things, how do you win trust of someone who's a really val- becomes a really valuable source over time, and then how do you nurture that relationship? Um, because it, at, on some level, you're clearly seeking advice, guidance, information from that person, much in the same way as some of our colleagues out uh, in the foundation and nonprofit space are when they're chatting up their boss or a colleague as they're trying to prepare a report or roll out a new effort. Yeah, it's a good question. Journalists are storytellers, too. We're trying to unpack information. I think the way that you acquire a certain level of reputation or trust can be varied now, especially in our modern media era. So it used to be when I was a young journalist that the way that you acquired that that gold standard was sometimes the power of the outlet you worked for. Uh, The reach, the audience size, the, uh, the extent to which you can help Washington tell its story to the broadest possible masses. Nowadays, in the, in the news media environment, sometimes the segment of the storytelling environment that you work with is going to be your gold standard. So for instance, if you're covering a certain range of issues, if you're working for a very small but very influential outlet and you're reaching a very specialized audience, that is your ticket to being uh, trusted. Um, if you're covering a Republican president, Mm -hmm. and you're working for a Republican-leaning, right-leaning outlet, nowadays the the news media is so segmented, the opportunities you have to tell your story are so varied that sometimes you can be a very big fish in a smaller pond by working for a particular outlet. And the same would be true if you were working in a Democratic-controlled environment. So uh, I think over time it's the trust is, have you done a good job, and are you uh, are you honest and, and fair? I think also the quality of your work sh- stands up. So for instance, if, you're, if you've given hell to a, a cross-section of Washington and you've done it fairly, you get a reputation for being you know, a pretty honest broker. And I think that's kind of the sweet spot that I've tried to be in over a long period of time. E- even working for a variety of outlets is you know, try to raise hell as, as freely as you can, but it, as fairly as you can. Gotcha. So just a reminder, everybody, uh, if you have questions and you're on the webinar technology, if you look on the lower left-hand corner, you can go ahead and type them in. We'll be taking them, and I'll pose them on your behalf to Alexis. If you're on Facebook Live, again, I think in the comment section down there, you can type in a question, and as you do, uh, we will be throwing them at Alexis. So uh, I, I just believe in, and, and trust that you are part of this conversation, so we want to make sure we're hearing from you. Type in your questions as you have them. I see someone who looks like they've just posted one in there. Um, let's pivot a little bit from listening and gathering information. Actually, before we do, Alexis's top tips for gathering a story. What are the things you know you need to do to go from, I don't know anything about this, whatever the issue might be, to I feel comfortable enough to write a story and represent it to other people as this is the stuff you need to know and it's accurate and true. Well, one of the things that's great about covering the White House is that, as I was saying, so many topics come through and you cannot possibly be an expert in everything. So you have to be a generalist. Um, And one of the things that's great about the world that we live in now is that you can be organized and you can work in advance because 
Um, oftentimes in Washington there are certain cycles. So if you're covering Congress, you know there are certain cycles to the things that they're focusing on. So for instance, I knew this fall we're going to deal with a certain topic, taxes for instance. The, the administration is keenly interested in that. I've covered taxes in the past. I am very familiar with a certain range of arguments. And there are certain recurring arguments depending on what party that you're in. So you can be prepared from memory or you can get prepared very quickly by stockpiling information about whatever the uh, initiatives may be. Right now, for instance, we're in a limbo period because the details of what Republicans would like to do with taxes have been unsettled and they're still secret and we're going to see what they are and then it's, they're going to get picked to death like ducks. So we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> picked but, to death <coughs> like yes, ducks. Yes, by ducks. But, <laughs> but we know you can anticipate a certain range of things. What's hardest I think as a journalist is to encounter something that you truly have no right. foundation in at all. So what I try to do is think as creatively as I can uh, about who are the experts in that issue and try to reach out to them. Now, Washington is full and outside of Washington in the states. Uh, we Some have, of these folks probably work at the foundations absolutely. of nonprofits who are. Who I mean, part Washington of this is not the the vessel of all wisdom, right? So. Or, you know, in cities and states, we know there are experts, and um, most of us are hampered by time in mm -hmm. journalism. And I think many of your audience know that one of the things that we try to do is work fast. We try not to be lazy, but the world we live in doesn't have news cycles in the old way, and everybody knows that. <coughs> so we're looking for people to have ready information, be accessible, um, try to be responsive, and. I what does that mean, responsive? Just that to means unpack that, that a little bit, um, like in, I in think a real lot of terms. In, I think a, one of the practical things that you hear a lot in think tanks or out there in expert land or in academia is if journalists are calling you, can you please call back as rapidly as possible? <coughs> rapidly today means within a couple hours, not by tomorrow, right? <coughs> so that has been a challenge. Um, it's kind of we're training news sources. And oftentimes when you see journalists going to the same sources, mm -hmm. you may say in frustration, why are they going to the same sources over and over again? Part of it is it, it's not laziness, uh, it's sometimes it's habit, but it's also the reliability of I'm going to get a response back. And I know that that's not a satisfactory answer, but what we the, live in that world. What was the, there was a Seinfeld episode where they had uh, a, a host of characters and Jerry was upset because he was like number four on speed dial, yes. I think his new girlfriend or something like that. It seems to be like, my own experience is that's true, both yes. on the journalism side, but also working in the policy world when I lived as a walk for a while, that Journalists, because the world is moving so rapidly, part of your reputational capital is yes. I'm responsive. I'm going to answer <laughs> within 15 to 20 minutes. And yes. The answer might be, I can't help you here, but I'm going to steer you towards somebody else who can. And that actually builds some yes. reputational capital. But that being responsive gets you into that sort of mental Rolodex of there are four or five people who can help me wade through this issue or steer me to the people who can. Yes. And that, that that is often a really, really effective way. Responsiveness, you can't undersell how critical Can I also tell you a pet peeve of mine yeah, as a please. journalist? All right. For those of, everyone has a website. Everybody has this fabulous information. There are experts everywhere. But as somebody who's a journalist and I might be going after information cold and I need a quick update on something, one of my pet peeves is I go onto the website and I cannot find the phone number oh, yeah. for... Oh, wait a minute. You use the phone? Yes, I use the phone. That's an amazing yes. idea. So there's something on the web where it says, send in your... Can you fill out this form? For and it's media going, inquiries, For media please. inquiries. Can I just tell you, I will, I will go on to some other place because I don't have time to fill in the thing and wait for somebody to find me back. If there's a human on the other side if of it, right? If there's a human on the other side. And I know people are understaffed or whatever, and it's trying to, you're trying to use your website to funnel information to the right place. But if I have a phone number, I will use that. So, so perfect looks like what? You would perfect, go on to perfect a... Perfect looks like I go onto a website, and it has a drop-down somewhere, contact, under contact, and it has something about uh, media, media affairs, public information, whatever. And I actually get a human on the other end of that phone. So that it doesn't have to be the expert. It could be the no, person. No, it just could be somebody who answers the phone. And I'll say, do you have a media affairs? Do you have somebody, blah, 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 blah. And then I get a chance to say, here's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Can I get somebody? And you know, the perfect, the world of perfect yes, is please. that somebody says, I will have somebody get back to you in two seconds. And can you shoot me an email that just tells me what you just told me? I'm happy to do that. But somehow within 
an hour or two hours, I'm going to actually hear something back. We have something for you. No, we don't have an expert. Somebody will call you back in 45 minutes or whatever. Because this is the world we live in. Right. Time right. is time is a wasting. Okay. <laughs> time is a wasting. How are we doing on questions? Do we have anything that we want to pass on? Okay, guys, get your questions in. We're going to continue. The place I'd like to take our conversation now, which, but that, by the way, that is just awesome advice. Uh, so if you're working on a new web redesign or something, real actual phone Phones. numbers who are attached to human beings yes. that get answered, not the main line and not something that actually helps you steer reporters, if that's what you do, if you have experts. Uh, on your staff, and almost inevitably all of you do, um, because all of us are, are working on really extraordinary ideas and trying to bring them to life in some way or another. Um, writing. Let's pivot and talk a little bit about writing, because I think that's something we all do, and we all continue to put a premium on that, that that's a real, tangible, and fundamental skill. Uh, we had Charles Bro Blow, Bro. Charles Blow spoke at our conference in 2016 in Detroit. He was interviewed by our board chair, Jesse Salazar. And Jesse asked him a pretty simple question, which was, how do you go about the process of writing? And, and Charles's answer was brilliant and fun. He said, panic, 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 write. Can you, that may be a satisfactory <laughs> answer, but for folks who are tuning in saying, I'd love to have the opportunity to hear from a professional writer who works on deadlines, who covers a wide variety of topics, whether it's at the White House or elsewhere, how do you go about it? Are you someone who drafts outlines? Are you somebody who, take me through your process. Well, Charles is a really good writer, and he, he has the opportunity to write about what he thinks. So the idea of thinking deeply before you start is actually a really, that's a good starting point. Uh, in journalism, as a beat reporter, where you're, you're, it's not so important what you think as, as what you're going to help other people decide about some, some event or set of information, oftentimes you have to start writing even before you've thought it through. I like to, to at least take a, a second to write a, a little mini outline, and sometimes it's just keywords at the top. And I will actually start, it's more like my thoughts of things that are important. Sometimes it's also going to be how to tell the story. In other words, uh, I'm thinking through not just the information, but the art of the information. What does that mean? The art of the information is I've written for a newspaper, I've written for newsletters, I've written for a um, weekly magazine, and I've written for digital. And they're different. And they're different. Okay. I've written for podcasts, I've you know written for video scripts, and they all call on a different, and you have to learn about storytelling in those different formats, different platforms. Uh, but you, in every case, you want to draw people in. And what I've learned over time is uh, that's not a given, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a given. So you're trying to impart something that's important or entertaining or informative or uh, accessible. But you want to tell it in a way that you're going to draw people in, often people who are not experts in something. Why is this important? So, Sean, you, when you and I learned journalism, it was the why should we care mm -hmm. test. Why should someone care about this story that I'm telling them? And you have to get to that somewhere mm -hmm. pretty soon. You can't nowadays wait until the end. And um, so that's part of what I'm doing with my little keyword outline is, do I have a a, a person who's helping to tell the story, like, for instance, a, a quote, a president's quote, or some scene setter. Um, oftentimes, if the speaker is very familiar and people are very knowledgeable about the person who's speaking or is imparting the information, you want to sometimes draw them in, right? A, make them a, a character in the story. So I will actually start with an outline and then I'll start. But I have often started a story, a, a, an actual news article, uh, thinking that I know where I'm going to start, and then I've changed my mind. So uh, my editors will sometimes pull out their hair, like, "What's where is your story? What we're waiting for your story?" Mm -hmm. And you know, within two hours or something, and I'll be like, "Well, I I changed the lead, right? I just scrapped that lead and started over." No, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes you can tell you've talked yourself into a different way to tell the story, or the story is telling itself to you in a different way. So I'm not sure that there's a set way, but thinking about it before you start. The panic part that, that Charles is describing mm -hmm. is more if you're going to do a long form feature article, then it's definitely panic. I can remember I had an editor, Michael Kelly, who's, 
who's dead now, mm -hmm. but he he talked about writing his first article for the New York Times Magazine, and I think it had to do with Ted Kennedy. And he he got he was so intimidated by the idea of starting, he said he actually threw up. <laughs> thinking, thinking about it. So you can work yourself into a swivet about stuff, no matter how talented and practiced you are. Whether you're writing a book or an article or you're writing a script for something. So uh, it's, it's, it's ironic you say that Catherine Boo, who spoke at our conference this year, watched the interview with Charles Blow before coming down to Miami for the conference, and she just seized on that, the panic panic. She's like, I know that. And she's, yes. of course, a Pulitzer Prize winning, National Book Award winning writer. So this is, you're in good company if you feel uncomfortable yes. as you're writing. But you just said something, and I don't want to go unremarked on, which is you said finding the person in the story, the character in the story, so that they could help you tell the story, the character. Mm -hmm. Talk about that, because I don't necessarily think, I always think that way when I think about journalism as, as, as the person who brings you through it, but of course, it makes all the sense in the world. Can you just sort of offer us why why you, well, why you think that way? Well, I think uh, every every uh, story that we're telling now. Remember, I'm dealing with nonfiction, right? I'm dealing with the world of news and uh, not fake news. And what we'll we're get there in a minute. We'll, we'll get there in a minute. But we're trying to tell. We're trying to ex describe as journalists uh, what's. What is happening? Mm -hmm. It could be a condition that people don't see, or an event that a lot of people know about. And why is it important to you? Why you should care about it? But in the best terms, it has some impact on real people. And so we're trying. I'm as a journalist, I'm thinking through, what are the human terms of this? What makes it accessible? And oftentimes, we're dealing with experts who have information and data. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. In politics. We rely much too heavily on polling, mm -hmm. which is a metric supposedly of a world of human thought or feelings or condition that has been boiled down to by supposed experts telling us, you know, with a margin of error of plus or minus 3%, how a certain range of an audience or our demographic is feeling or thinking about something. We, in, in journalism, gravitate too often to just the hard data mm -hmm. without trying to also tell something about the story, the condition within that. So in a political story, we're often trying to tell the story about the stakes. What are the stakes? In other words, what has made a group of people either embrace or reject the thought process of millions or thousands or dozens of people? And why, why have they decided to do that? So sometimes the storytelling is about the political stakes, but in real terms. So-and-so is petrified that they're going to lose their power and their seat, and this is why they're doing XXX. Um, and oftentimes you can tell a story around the stakes, right? Uh, sometimes you can tell it around an event. <coughs> the event was prompted by a certain range of things and, or a condition in the world or the, our environment or whatever. So I'm often trying to think about it in terms of the human mm -hmm. condition and, and the audience itself. Why should they be interested in this? Um, and there are some stories that are just incredibly hard to tell. Uh, I'll give you an example. I think it's hard to tell the public why should they care about money and politics. Um, I think that's a, a static story that they're so tired of that it's, you, it takes creativity to tell that story. Some stories just tell themselves. Okay. With drama, right? What's uh, give me an example of of you were writing a piece and it just never quite got off the ground. Like you, you'd look back and say, "I finished the piece; it's acceptable," but I would I didn't love it. Like what happened? What were some of the conditions that kind of set you up not to succeed? Usually, those stories are not enough time, maybe not enough expertise, right? Um, maybe not enough. Uh, dimensions to the story, right, to, to, to make it interesting so that you actually have some new way of bringing together the information. Um, sometimes it's so wonky that I failed miserably in trying to tell the story without the jargon, the jargon that is so endemic to our governance in Washington, our military, you know, just the discussion about our economics. Uh, we are conditioned to understand that. It just takes more time and it is a more creative process to help the American people understand something that is just incredibly academic and jargony. And it takes a certain skill and some days I just fail at that miserably because either I don't know enough 
or I haven't had enough time, or I just had to move on to the next thing, and you know, I gave up. I threw up my hands <laughs> at describing, <laughs> you know, like for instance, I'll give you an example. Please. Th this is a, a week in which uh, the president has said that he wants to decide on the next Fed chair, the mm -hmm. Federal Reserve, our central bank. Uh, most Americans, if you you know, put a gun to their head, they couldn't tell you anything about the Fed chair, the Federal Reserve chair, why it's important in our governance, you know, what does the Federal Reserve Central Bank do, and whatever. So the challenge will be, we'll see front page stories about this, mm -hmm. and we will find that, you know, 3.4 uh, percentage of the readership paid any attention to this, right? And there's good reasons because it takes a while to tell the story about why we should all care. So that's a story, an example. Tax. You know, why should you want your, the tax benefits of your 401k? You know, why would you not want to give that up as a middle class American, you know, uh, taxpayer? It takes a while to explain that to mm -hmm. people. Why, what are the stakes for you if the, the Republicans decide to use you as an offset? What is an offset? All of those things. I don't feel like an offset. Y yes, <laughs> but you could be Sean. But I could be. You could be Sean. Uh, let's, talk, let's just dig, dig a little bit deeper into jargon because I think this is a place where if we were able to see our friends out there who are watching, they'd probably be smiling and nodding and going, yeah, I deal with that within my organization. Yes. Because we all develop our own lexicon and languages around and vocabularies around the work that we do. And it gets oftentimes pretty technocratic pretty quickly. Uh, and I feel like one of the jobs, that sort of sacred jobs that we all hold at these different organizations where we serve is trying to remind our colleagues and sometimes our bosses that plain English is critical if you really want to try to achieve some level of understanding uh, with folks within the organization, uh, among your colleagues, but it, even more broadly uh, out into the world, that jargon is deadly. Uh, jargon is deadly and it's also a weapon. And why I mean that is in the world of politics that we live in over time, we have seen some of the most uh, creative and expert communicators work long and hard, and I'm sure your audience knows this, to find an accessible way to describe something that seems on its face to be true and accessible and honest, and sometimes it's the most artificial and duplicitous sort of explanation. So if it's the clear skies, whatever, or <laughs> if it's the, you know, uh, 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 the acronyms for legislation or an initiative, uh, it can be manipulated as we've seen over time. Uh, in Washington, we deal with that a lot. I once wrote an article uh, for National Journal about how the term climate change, climate change, had become so freighted and debated and such a political football, just the terminology. Let's how, linger there for a how did minute. How did that happen? How did science lose that, right? Well, it was fascinating because I actually ended up talking to non-politicians. So I ended up, to try to do this story, I talked to non-scientists and non-communications experts, and I talked to uh, Madison Avenue sort of uh, marketers. Mm -hmm. how, you know, what is, how did this happen and all this? What is the art of marketing something where you uh, come up with a phrase or you attack the phrase? And... Uh, you know, I ended up writing this story at a time when it had already slipped into the world of no return, right? So climate change is, it, it followed a whole terminology. There's many articles and books have been written about this, how we used to talk about the environmental movement, mm -hmm. and we talked about, you know, ecology. We don't talk about that anymore. So uh, it's interesting how the stakeholders choose the jargon or the catchphrases, or the bumper sticker, right? Mm -hmm. And then how they market that, and the information that goes into that, the campaigns that go into that, the, the, the advertisements, that that. the yeah. money that pours into that. And um, I think it's, it's incumbent on a lot of journalists, if, if possible, to pull back from that and not fall into that. Um, it certainly is part of the debate about abortion rights, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Pro-life. Right, we and we've seen it on many, many, uh, you know, intense campaigns. Um, I remember when I was covering George W. Bush, President Bush was very interested in something called uh, Social Security personal in investment accounts. Do you mm -hmm. remember when he went around the country and he was trying to talk America into this idea that you could control your money, that the best thing in the world was if the government gave you back your Social Security money and let you invest it for yourself. This was before the financial meltdown. 
And what was interesting about it is the president and his team pulled together terms of art to try to describe this and make it as appealing as possible. The president went around the country. The more he talked about it, the lower the poll numbers were. And he talked America right out of this. The more he tried to sell it, the fewer buyers he discovered. And it was because the way of explaining it didn't make sense to people. It, it just lacked a certain kind of logic that people could apply to their real lives. And, and it failed miserably. So you can see that jargon and the bumper stickers can work both ways. You have to you know, guard against, as a journalist, how it's being applied, but also use some good common sense, right? Oh, uh, God, yeah. Yes, please, and thank you. Yes. How are we doing on questions? We've got a couple. Tristan's going to uh, share them with me, and I'll try to repeat them to make sure that everybody hears them. Does that work for you? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Great. So Alec asks, uh, hello, I work for a nonprofit communications agency, and we often pitch story ideas to journalists to focus on the experts within partner organizations, primarily in education. <coughs> practices are most effective in capturing journalist interest? What, what makes a good pitch? What makes a good pitch? One of the things that I think it makes a really good pitch is preparation. So for instance, you, you're with the communications network. Networking is about when you need journalists and also when you don't need them. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I would suggest is, and this is really harder for the stakeholders who are trying to sort out in our modern media world, <coughs> because a lot of journalists are, are now younger and they're covering multiple beats and it's harder to figure out who are the beat experts. But if you can, you know, figure out the news outlets that you really care about. Try to identify who are some of the bylines or the, the folks doing work that you admire, that you'd like to know. Get to know them before you need them. Mm -hmm. So if you can, develop that relationship early. Reach out. Uh, even though I know that it's hard to even say that because a lot of journalists are so time constrained, I, I myself know that I'm um, on the receiving end of, of hundreds and hundreds of emails in a, any given week or any given day or any given issue. But if you, I would also encourage people to use the phone. Like, it's a shocking thing, but use the phone. Personal contact. I so like email doesn't work. And uh, meltwater well, and these e hard. blasts and all of that. Also use the subject line creatively. But I would say be prepared. Anticipate what the, when the issues are going to be ripe. Know who it is you want to appeal to. Um, try to be aware of how much limited time they have. If it can be as personal as possible, make it personal. Like, don't be afraid to use the phone. Mm -hmm. um, this seems to be a problem for younger people than using the phone. Using the phone, really. I think even practice your phone technique. Hi, da 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 da. Thirty second pitch, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and try to uh, lay out what it is that you like to offer. Uh, a lot of times I get email pitches for I have an expert. If you're doing such and such or whatever, I have an expert for you. I, I barely read that because it has to be an expert on, a, on what I'm going to be working on or what I'm anticipating. Right. You're a surgeon. You know, if someone yes. hands you a chainsaw when you need a scalpel, that's not going to help you that It's day. not going to help the scattershot thing yeah. because I'm not organized enough to put that away for the rainy day when I'm going to need the expert on because that person just wrote a book. But, but if you build a relationship yes. with that person, you, know, yes. you, you find some downtime that's mutually agreeable, go off and get a coffee, get to know them a little bit. They have a better understanding of what you yes. might be working on, some places where you might be weak, and, and presumably you would learn a little bit about what their organization does, what they might be able to bring to the table. Totally. Um, you worked for Third Way at one point. Mm -hmm. Third Way uh, was very good at doing that. Tried yeah. to find journalists in the downtime, mm -hmm. in before they hit the major you know, overload of information and try to develop relationships so that uh, journalists would see that particular organization as a resource. That's exactly right. Yeah, we were really you trying know? to make sure that that Rolodex and we talked about, that Jerry Seinfeld Rolodex, we were somewhere on there. Artful. And, well, thank you. I mean, uh, if I can say something that's a bit impolite, we called it the drug dealer approach. Yes. Right? And it was, we're going to be as helpful as we possibly can be as many times as we can be before we ever have an ask of a journalist, which is we're going to invite them in. We're going to get to know them. We're right. going to understand how they work. We're going to try to figure out ways to be helpful, even if it doesn't benefit us. Sometimes the answer is going to be, we're not the right people to help you, but here are two or three people, two people who are right. really great. Yeah. And sometimes that for us was enough of, a, of a, a connection point where the phone call would come to us and we'd pass it along. We'd get the hockey assist. We'd yes. get a little credit, and eventually you could build that into I'm working on, we're working on something, there's a big report we're doing, we think it's interesting, we could at least 
we had the goodwill to borrow two or three minutes of someone's time to have them tell us, you know, in a great relationship it would be, that's not interesting. That was helpful information to know. Or that's not going to work right now because of X, Y, and Z that we just couldn't see outside of our walls. But occasionally you'd also find that people had appreciated all of the goodwill and good efforts that you'd made prior to be helpful to them, to be that resource, and they might give you one. Give, have well, a, you're, have built, a you're, you're called the communications network, and what you're trying to establish is how can everyone collaborate to build a, you know, the better results out of collaboration in some cases. And I think you probably have a lot of alliances within your membership or your audience. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that all everyone is thinking that way, you know, I think you're doing a really good job. Thanks. The other element of it is I think um, stakeholders or experts, they also have to be, uh, I, I think they have to be brave enough to understand that if you're reaching out to journalists, you do not control the result. So you're trying to be honest and candid, but you, you do not control the result. And I'll give you another example that relates to the third way. Third way was brave enough to take Molly Ball as a journalist on a, um, a series of outreach uh, oh, trips. Oh, I read about this recently. Yeah, this uh, was just for the, the last Atlantic, few months. Yes. Right. And uh, Molly Ball is a terrific political reporter, Fantastic. wonderful um, uh, colleague and ally and knows so much about politics. And the third way was trying to research post-election what had gone out on outside the country and create a report. And they were brave enough to let a journalist come and ride along. It was like riding along with the cops. You know, we're going to mm -hmm. drive around the country and you're going to see and hear what we're doing. And then, obviously, Molly Ball was in charge of the the um, article. What was interesting is, and I don't think Third Way was probably too happy about this, is that Molly Ball came away and said, you know, I heard everything that they heard and I was really surprised when I read the report because the report was about what they wanted to hear, not what they really heard. Right. right? And so you have to be brave enough to make sure that you're you know, opening your door at, to the information or your alliances, but you know, you don't control the result. Right. I think the other thing, just Alec, to, to, to then we'll let this lie. I'm sure there's a few other questions out there, but uh, your expert when you're pitching somebody, I think this is probably blindingly obvious, but it's worth saying, it, they have to speak in plain English, right? Oh, yes. I mean, my, uh, when quotes, I was at CNN. And in quotes. And, and in quotes. quotes, in yeah. quotes. So, so, so give me an example of that. What, how does that work? Well, here's one of the things that is really hard. This is true for freelance journalists. This is true for science journalists. This is very true of radio and television. I heard uh, uh, NPR was doing an interview this morning with a legal expert mm -hmm. who... Uh, this was talking about the indictments that came yes, down. Yes, yeah. this is... And, uh, <laughs> and NPR was about to kill this very expert, <laughs> legal expert, because he couldn't get the thoughts out fast enough and they didn't have enough time. Mm -hmm. So it was like they were trying to give him a hint, like, can you... Maybe it wasn't he didn't have enough coffee, whatever. He was too relaxed in what he was saying for this radio hit. And journalists are now so pressed for time that what we really love is not just an expert, but an articulate expert. So I don't have time. And a pithy I, one. A pithy right. one. Good, give good quote, know your topic, and uh, I just all, I want you all to understand some of the most uh, quotable lawmakers that we know on Capitol Hill practice before they run out to the elevators to just... Is that right? Oh, yes. Lindsey Graham is famous for this, Senator Graham of South Carolina. They work it out, they think about it, they practice it for the day. It's almost like, you know, the Bible reading for the day. And then they go out because they know they're going to be in a scrum with reporters. They're, they know what questions that they're going to get asked. If they want to be heard and get on TV, you've got to have something zippy to say, and you've got to do it in a short amount of time. Now, this seems like an easy to do. It's not that easy to do. And it's hard for experts to practice. But I would encourage people to think through what it is that you want to say. What's the information? And then can you do it in a zippy way? Right. I think the other thing just to think about, uh, we used to do this when I was at the Center for American Progress, was if you had an idea you wanted to get out that was relevant, salient to the news of the day, we would actually go up to our experts, and it's probably much easier now when you have an iPhone, but we would literally record them. We'd hand them the newspaper and we'd say, this is what's happening. Give me your two or three top reactions. It forced them into the discipline of offering up those pithy quotes, but it also gave us a deliverable. When we were going to pitch a reporter, it was, hey, I've got so-and-so. Here's what they're already saying. So yes. you knew before you got on the phone with them 
more or less what the goods would be, and particularly helpful for, for television and radio folks because they could see the performance as well. Yes. And we know that's just a really yes. critical, critical element when yeah. you're doing the television And piece. also, I would be indulgent because not all journalists, especially journalists yeah. like me, we're going to ask the stupid question. We are going to, but there should be in, in, in the world you live in no stupid questions, right? None, zero. If you get approached by a journalist and they ask a stupid question, only John McCain can turn to a journalist and say, that is the stupidest question. <laughs> really, you're going to, that isn't going to fly if you say, as an expert, that is a really dumb question. So try not to do that. And try to, as Sean is saying, if you want to start your day or before you do an interview, um, and you want to record, talk to yourself. If, just practice a few questions. Uh, reporters may ask you a couple of very simple things to get off and running, and you can practice the what is this about? Mm -hmm. what, what is your argument? And, and really boil it down and hone it down into something that someone wants to quote and is interesting. Other questions? Yes. Uh, Jessica asks, how can nonprofits provide a multidimensional story? What elements are you most interested so a multidimensional story. If Jessica yeah. wants to come with you and says, Alexis, I've got photographs, I've got video, I've got B-roll, I've got experts, two or three experts that you can talk to, how does that land with you? The well, fully packaged kind of, you know, it's almost like the blue apron approach. You know, you yes. pull out the box, the ingredients are there, and you just have to cook. Exactly. I think it's going to depend a little bit on the outlet. So, for instance, if it's going to be radio or television, you know you're going to do a certain kind of storytelling. If you're going to be interviewed for a podcast, you know you're going to be able to talk in a longer format. If you want to invite a journalist to come along and experience something, so, for instance, if you're saying, I have... Um, uh, you know, the most beautiful polar bears and we want to take you on this trip, right? Um, you know, that, that is... sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, that's I a like very compelling bears. story and, you're, and he, you want to set that up with the right team of journalists and here's why and how you could do it and all that stuff. And so the, it's going to depend on the medium a little bit, the, pl the platform. But the multidimensional can be, I have, uh, to help you tell the story, I have folks who can describe the impact like it has some impact. If you have a storyteller who has a human is best, but so um, not the expert. So like a, an ideal the expert. The expert is part of it. The the actual data is part of it, right? So if you have polling data, studies, reports, also, uh, and I think this should go without saying, uh, if you have a report, don't make me work to the, the end of your report. To, You're I'm not, not going to read forty I, I pages of a PDF. To read the okay. 60 pages of your PhD. I have time to read probably the executive summary and it should be zippy. I should get to the, I should really get to the nut of something or have a couple quotes like pull out quotes, you know, visually could be interesting. Also in today's social media world, what do I do as a journalist that I never used to do before? I go to a report, a study, your tweets, your social media, uh, and I'm going to take a snapshot photograph of that, a screen save, and I'm going to retweet or I'm tweet that out. So if you're tweeting something yourselves, I might be retweeting that or I might be pulling that out of a report with a link to your report. So if your report looks interesting and you've got that pullout quote and the, the summary, you know, then you have to think about that in a social media way that I didn't used to think about. As a as a print journalist, and so there are many ways to be thinking about telling the story in multiple layers. And also, don't be afraid to repeat, 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 repeat. Right? You think everybody has heard your story? Journalists, you know, we live in a bubble, but you know, we may not have heard it more than once. It was the old Ronald Reagan line: like the moment you get sick of telling is the first time they start hearing yes. it. Yes, yes. And I've heard that at the White House many times from presidential teams that they feel that the president has to go around the country and repeat, repeat, repeat. This is a why President Trump is so challenging to members of his own party because he, uh, his attention span goes to so many topics. Other questions? Yes. Andrea asks, you suggested to find journalists in their downtime. What's a good way of figuring out when that is? Yeah, we live in a 24 hour news cycle. Yes, Do you have a right. downtime anymore? Well, the downtime might be, uh, you have to understand something about the cycle in which they're reporting. So, for instance, um, I know a lot of, uh, of journalism uh, ex 
experts, uh, terrific reporters who are with mainstream outlets who have described how they have to get their material in much earlier in the day. So uh, I've heard Peter Baker from the New York Times, for instance, who's a colleague, talk about how uh, he's you know, himself adapted over time. He looks like a young child, but he isn't. And he's adapted over time. He's <laughs> so young. He's that. so young looking. <laughs> um, and he's adapted to the idea that he has to be pulling up information all day long. But it is often the case that uh, you have to understand something about the beat they cover. So for instance, in Peter's case, we'll use an example of the White House. Uh, we know that White House reporters have to be paying attention to what the president is tweeting in the morning. They may not necessarily be the team reporting that, but they're paying attention. So maybe the downtime could be morning coffee, but more likely it might be before the White House briefing coffee, right? So you have to understand something about the cycle in which they're working. Um, by late afternoon, Peter has talked uh, openly in public, I'm not telling any secrets, about how his uh, editors are trying to get stuff up on social media or in digital where it's just a short burst with a story to follow. And he said that he got into trouble with his editors, uh, I, I happened to hear him talk about it, where he was uh, laboring to write four paragraphs and they were screaming, one would be enough, Peter. <laughs> and he was just like, you know, artfully writing for paragraphs. He said, I thought I was being really fast. Four paragraphs was too much, right, for him. So you have to know something about the cycle. But if you know that he's going to end up writing one paragraph in a burst, make sure in advance that he knows what that one paragraph should be. So it's just, it just occurred to me as you were saying that, that those bursts, that, that a lot of the way news unfolds now is that it's conversations, right? Yes. There's the reporters who might be the authority because of the imprimatur of the New York Times or Real Clear Politics or whatever it might be, but that oftentimes experts will then chime in. In fact, I just saw this, I think it was last night, as a matter of fact, I was trying to understand the indictments that had come through, and a journalist that I liked and followed had linked to a series, like a tweet storm or whatever you call it, by some legal a expert, a thread, thank yeah. you, who literally, in plain English, God bless them, laid out what the actual indictments meant. And mostly, what was really encouraging about it was that they were, it was a much more sober and, and less breathless yes. uh, sort of uh, analysis, and I sort of felt more comfortable but that a journalist had actually, you know, had clearly been paying attention to a conversation that was happening among experts yes. and then pointed to it. Well, so this, that, is, this that is why uh, stakeholders, experts, are doing more of this themselves. They're live blogging or, or, or using social media to create their own threads of reaction or analysis in real time. Mm -hmm. And if you become the trusted resource on that subject, then more and more journalists are going to turn to you. It's so the it watering is, it holes well, of the internet, it's right? Well it's like, it's like understanding that the, the, the animals will find you if you are the watering Absolutely. hole. Absolutely. So you want to become the resource, but the point is don't agonize over it. You have to have it in real time. Um, you know, no one has thought to wait for six hours. We're all going to do the second day stories or the so third day stories. So the tweet process story. where you, you write it and then it has to be approved and then it has to go through legal and then maybe it'll get up within a day or two, you're saying that doesn't work? I'm just saying, you, unfortunately, you have to do it all. Right. You, I would say do it all. Other questions? Yes. Leslie asks, can Alexa speak to her experience with developing a strong writer-editor relationship with very different writing styles and voices? Oh, that's never happened oh, to you. Oh, golly, that is a tough issue. Yes, um, over time, uh, and this would be true in any workplace that you're in where you're having to do some kind of content production. You are, and in fact, this morning I was talking to a friend from NBC News, and we were talking about how <laughs> no matter what, at no matter how big your operation, every editor has a different idea and you're getting different directions. And not always is there an agreement in the same organization about what the product should look like. And oftentimes those debates don't get settled. Many times they do, but not always. And in journalism, it happens all the time, where you have an editor who comes from a particular disposition or expertise and wants things a certain way, or the format is going to drive how you present certain information. <coughs> in journalism, what we're struggling with is we're trying to not be swayed, especially, I, I've always written for nonpartisan um, news outlets, so I, we're always fighting to not be swayed 
uh, with bias, but, um, but oftentimes you have editors who have biases. Um, it's not just the reporters who have it. And, and, and we don't write our own headlines, so you can see that. So what are the tricks to it? First of all, you have to, uh, you have to recognize uh, what you're dealing with. Sometimes my tactic has been um, to give them a little bit of what they want. Uh, and other journalists, even on my staff, we've talked about what we know that a certain editor really goes for. And you try to put it in there. And you put it, we usually put it down, like whatever it is, that little trick, that shiny thing is. We put it down there. And we're glad it's there, whatever. And then we know the editor is going to move it up. But if it's not there, you're going to get holy hell, and you're going to—it's going to be more painful. So, we—you have to recognize what some of it is, and throw a little bit of it into the recipe, right? And be ready for that. Or you understand what the editors—not just stylistically, but what questions they're going to have. So they're going to ask you, "Did you go through this checklist of?" of questions or sources. Sometimes I've had editors who cannot stand a certain source and, and will not tolerate a, a copy that comes in using a certain source of information. Uh, and obviously for you stakeholders, you don't want to be that source. Right. Yeah. So you, I think uh, what you want to do when you're writing is try to understand before you start uh, what your editors expect and want. And, and always try to surprise them in a pleasant way. Like give them more of what they want, but then give them something you think they don't even know they want. And then they're delighted. It's like, oh, this is great. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Other questions? Catherine wants to know, uh, at a very basic level, I'd love to know some of the ABCs of how Alexis conducts interviews for stories. It sounds like she brings a recorder and a notepad for taking notes. I presume that she has to ask for explicit permission to record interviews. Does she ever run pieces of her story back by her interviewees to make sure she's captured things correctly? Uh, oh, wow. That's let's, a lot of let's questions. Let's actually start with Unpack the basics of, of on the record, off the record. And then we'll talk a little bit about the tools of the trade. But let's start with on the record, off the record. Because I think, boy, you know, who's a journalist and who isn't these days yeah. is so different because everyone's got a social media account. But, but maybe we start there. What are the rules of the road, the basics? Okay, in Washington, most people understand these. Also, I should mention, in Washington, D.C., this is a one-party town. That means that in Washington, and this, came up, this has come up in the context of the, um, the Russia investigation. In a one-party town, that means that you can record, uh, and only one party to the recording needs to uh, This is consent. legally true. This legally is true. This about, is the yeah. law in Washington, D.C. In California, for instance, it's a two-party state. You cannot record... Um, Without both parties being assenting to the I recording, I should have asked your permission. Are you okay? We recorded this. You didn't ask me, but you did. But you. But, but I don't have but to I because understood. legally. Yeah, right. legally, okay. legally, you could have recorded me with your iPhone while we were standing by the elevator. But but I'm assuming he didn't. I didn't. Um, uh, the other element of on the record, off the record, is that there are these gradations that live in journalism. And not all sources understand it, but uh, on the record means that I, you, have, you understand that I am taking your information and I have the power to use it and to attribute not just what you've said with quote marks, but your name, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you talk to me on background, it means that I can use it without attributing it to you. I can put quote marks around what you have told me, but I can also keep you hidden from the audience. And I can describe, more and more journalists are trying to describe in greater detail, what, where does the speaker live? Where do they come from? What's their specialty, right? So when you see more and more um, on background, unattributed uh, sourcing in the Washington Post and New York Times, you notice that the Post is saying, in interviews with 20 people, none of those 20 people are named, but in 20 friends, colleagues, whatever, you see more of that. If it's deep background, it means that you have given me um, information I can use, I cannot quote you, and I cannot attribute it, and I'm not actually supposed to use it except to then go run down, maybe to get it corroborated in some other way. I can speak as if it's come from God. I can use your information, but it's as if it's just come into my brain cells. And then off the record means that you have spoken to me and you are protected completely protected. I am not going to quote you, I'm not going to attribute it, and I can't use the information. 
oftentimes this is broken in Washington w over a duration of time because uh, I have information and then I run around town and try to find somebody else with that information without telling them that the voice has spoken to me like God, right? Mm -hmm. And this is abused often. Um, and it's abused oftentimes by the, the sources of the information. So those are some of the gradations. And then you have to set these ground rules up. You have to set the ground the rules. Now, here's another. In journalism, uh, I I the rule of journalism is that you as a news source cannot set the ground rules after you've begun. So for instance, if we've started, you cannot tell me, now listen, that really fascinating thing I told you, that's off the record. You're, I'm supposed to then say to you, too bad, that's not the rules. But oftentimes it's, it's the art of the deal. So the art of the deal sometimes is that someone <coughs> says, you know, uh, oftentimes in the White House, for instance, you'll have people who will say, can, can we all start, we're gonna do this on background. And then if, if, we, if I've said something really interesting, Let's go back at the end and negotiate with me about what you read back to me the quote and then I'll give you quote approval. The person was asking, do I ever take an interview and then go back to them? I only will do that if I have not understood. If I do not understand what someone has said and I really feel like I need to clarify, but I do not get their approval. If so, they have given me the quotes and I've recorded it or I've taken notes, I've been in the business 30 years, I just, they trust me and I have to trust them. Gotcha. As a courtesy, will you occasionally, before the piece runs, say, "Here's a, here's a, here's a version of this before it goes to"? There's nothing you're going to be able to do. The only time I have ever done that is in the White House. I have had occasion where the White House will say a, a source in the White House, and this has happened a few times. It, it happened at National Journal because we had time to do this. The person will talk to me and say, "I am going to talk to you, but you have to give me um, quote approval." And what they mean is, I'm going to just tell you everything. It's on background. I'm just blah, 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 blah. If they go off the record, we'll go back and forth, and I'll write on my notes. This is off the record. Then I use the quote, and I put it in context. And, uh, and so, because they've said, I will, you must get my approval, the way I have done that is I've taken one graph, not the whole story, one graph where their quote appears, and I'll email it, and I'll say, this is what you said. Does, do you give me a perm permission to use it? And oftentimes I will say to them, this is what you've said, uh, and then what normally happens, is this is why journalists are sometimes gratified to do this, is that I have never had someone come back to me and say, I don't want to use it after all. What they'll say is, I didn't say that very well. Can I say it better? Can I say it better? Right. And then I'll get a better quote. Gotcha. Uh, and, and Jessica's other question was, uh, was the tools that you walk into the room with. So these days, you know, I assume yes. you're walking in with yes. one of these yeah. uh, and a notebook. Tell me, tell me, what do you walk in the room with? What is, what's your gear? Well, the gear is, um, I usually have redundancy. So I'll have a digital recorder and then of course I have, a, um, you know, some kind of smartphone. We have journalists now. Uh, the other thing that has happened, especially in the modern era, is that most of us have downloaded some form of app that records uh, telephone conversations automatically. And that is because we're Whoa. all, we're, yes. <laughs> yeah. So there, there are apps that will record the phone conversation automatically and the subject is not aware of that. In DC, because it's a one party town, uh, that's protective for, for most of us. And um, that app ensures that... What is that app called, or one of them? Uh, well, there's versions of it. Um, uh, I forget. Call. There's a million of them. It's like... Uh, Go on iTunes call, and you'll call, find something. Call Recorder. Call Recorder or something. I'll give you an example of why it's so useful. Um, Bob Costa, Robert Costa from the Washington Post. Uh, after healthcare went down in the spring, the healthcare reform uh, GOP legislation went down, the president decided he was going to call two reporters. One was Maggie Haberman from the New York Times, and the other was Robert Costa from the Washington Post. Robert Costa was getting prepared to do Washington Week, and he was getting prepared on a Friday. In the Trump world, everything happens on Friday. Um, and the president made two surprise calls to journalists from these two major outlets. And I asked uh, Bob later on, because he said, oh, I always have my laptop, because he was live tweeting his conversation with the President of the United States. The President has just told me blah, blah, blah. And I said, Robert, how did you do this, right? How is this happening? He said, well, you know, I, I always I have my phone. And he said, I could see on the phone that it came in 
um, the telephone the number was masked. It's oh, masked. Okay. Anything from the White House is masked. And he thought, oh, I thought this was going to be a crank call or whatever. But I answered it. It was the President of the United States. Hi, Bob. I want to tell you about we've just pulled the bill. So he's recording this, and he's live tweeting it, and, he's, and then he ended up producing a, a terrific article about when the President called me. So we have to be prepared for this, right? And the other thing that journalists are using now more are um, secure texting. They're using uh, secure oh, right, right. Ac apps, and they're getting a lot of texting. So uh, in the world we live in now, because a lot of sources want their stuff to evaporate, um, they're using secure methods of communication on a smartphone, also texting. Uh, I'm not encouraging you secret stakeholders for doing that, but a lot of people are doing it. And then what about just pen and paper? Is that something that's Well, just I do that. Uh, I think it's just what you're used to. <clears throat> so when I say redundancies, I have a pad, I have paper, and here's why. Um, I don't do shorthand, but I can write faster than I can use a touch screen. So I'm, I, it's just what I'm used to, and I'm, I'm very tr I trust my ability to write the key things and for me to read my handwriting afterwards. <laughs> um, some journalists, it's just what you're used to, what, right. you're, what you know. And some journalists are super fast at using the touch screen and very, they trust what they're doing. I just you know, use what I'm used to. So we promised folks we were going to talk about two other things. I want to make sure we get to those, and I'm mindful yeah. that we're a little over time, but if you want to stick around, if you're okay with yeah, that, we'll keep absolutely. going. So one is, I think you kind of just alluded to this, is we're in a new era for journalists where oftentimes you're walking into a political rally or whatever it might be, and it's almost, not almost, it is a hostile environment to be a journalist. Yes. There's the fake news media, uh, people, uh, you know, saying all sorts of hurtful and harmful things about the field and about the practice. What's that like in this moment right now? It's a, that is also a really good question because it's not just where you are physically, it's also in the, in the, in the internet space that you occupy. Oh, well, like Twitter and yes. people coming so at you. So journalists now are, are very aware of uh, the hostility of the electorate or just the lack of trust, right? We know mm -hmm. that erosion has been happening over decades. That's not new. But we also see it in our emails or in uh, social media on Twitter or Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and here's what I have, this is my adaptation to this. Uh, one of the things that is weird about the internet is it encourages people to do things that they wouldn't do normally in their social graces. You, this is my assumption. Um, that to my face, uh, someone I have never met is not going to make assumptions and tell me that I should get out of the business and I'm a complete hack. Usually they would wait until after a cup of coffee before they said you're a complete hack and I've decided you're a complete hack. So wh the way I've responded to criticism is oftentimes, I, and I don't respond to all of it, but if someone has taken the time to email me that they've got a complaint about the writing, reporting, commentary, and they think that it's sloppy, weird, biased, whatever, I. I try to go through to find the, and, and, and if they sign their name. I look for the nut of it. What is that they're saying? It's oftentimes, it's because I've been unclear in my reporting. I've made an assumption, right, that was wrong, that people understood a certain range of things. Or sometimes they read right past something. So I will take the time sometimes to write back, and I will say, you know, the article did say blah, 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 and I'll point them to that. And then I'll say, you know, but maybe that didn't come through, so it's a really good point, and thank you very much for your time. If it's been really harshly personal, then I will write back in a really nice way, usually, not in a harsh way, and I'll say, I bet you that, you know, you did not know that this is not the f my first time at the rodeo, right? That I've actually done this, this, and this in my career. And, and then I am always, always, they write back and they say, Thank you so much for writing. Because they just want to be heard? They want to be heard, and they want to make contact. And they're chagrined, usually, and then they write back like their mother's daughter or son. You know, polite, educated, cogent, articulate, and grateful to have some sort of exchange. And I'm grateful, too. I learn a lot. I learn a lot from them. But, the, but there is still a... a, uh, a Yes. So we're in an atmosphere of hostility. Hostility. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't think that journalists are going to um, change that, except by just doing good work. So if we, I don't think we're just going to outshout people or um, or talk 
a certain range of people who are disgruntled or distrustful of the media. Um, one of the things that, I, I'll just tell you one of the things that I'm conflicted about. The, in the media world that we're living in now, the news media are trying to experiment more and more with fact checking. Foundations, and there are some good ones probably out there, are, are giving money to news organizations to try to hire more fact checkers, to try to hold um, our public speech up to some level of scrutiny in real time and talk about what's fake news and what's real news and what's so information. The Knight Foundation's been really active and I, and I know you've had people say that, and I'm one of these, I don't like to use the term fake news because to me what it is is propaganda or misinformation, let's just call it what it is. But one of the why hasn't that taken hold? I don't mean to interrupt you, but, but why, oh, why, why do we call uh, it? Is fake, fake news just such a great... Donald Trump did not um, invent the term fake news. That's been around for decades. Uh, but it got a hashtag in front of it, and it looks kind of great on social media. Um, it sounds whatever. I just think we shouldn't repeat, you know, we just shouldn't repeat. <coughs> we should, it's unfortunate, misinformation, propaganda, those are longer words. Propaganda is probably hard for people to spell, uh, <laughs> maybe. So, but one of the things I think is the counter, and I'm struggling with this, is some news organizations have decided that the counter to defend reporting is to, to say these are the facts and you're false. It's false. It's wrong. Uh, I am not sure that, that we're making inroads with that. I, I think that that is an experiment that I, I, I know we're investing a lot in it. I myself love our colleagues who do it. They do a great job, politic fact you know, um, the fact checkers. But for those who are enamored and, hot and you know, enamored with the idea that the press corps or the news business is wrong, I think it's so complicated I'm much more sympathetic to them. One of the things that President Trump uh, dynamically seized on, and reality TV stars would do this, is that our news media and our entertainment started to merge decades ago. And it's harder and harder for the audience to understand what is the news media, what is the mainstream media, what is the new new media, you know, what, where, how many times, you know, do we have people come up to us and say, "What should I read? Where should I get my information?" Mm -hmm. As if we have like this perfect, you know, box for them. Here's what you should read. Uh, here's what you should consume. Here's where you should go for your information. Um, so we're in an experimental phase, but I'm very empathetic to the audience. I share their frustration, and, and I understand why they're upset about it and questioning, but I just think that g offering the best information is the antidote. The best meaning fair, balanced. Other questions? What do you do when there's a similar organization who is bigger and seems to get all the attention? We lost a BBC interview that had been scheduled for our leader to the leader of a bigger organization. Ah, uh, getting getting uh, yeah. a better booking, I guess, in television. That yes. would be the, 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 the phrase, a better booking. Yes, this is um, oh gosh, that's such a tough one, and I I really uh, feel for um, the folks who talk about that because I know my. Uh, I've been in the past guilty of this too, where you go again and again to the same watering hole because they're sort of reliable and they get a name for themselves. Um, but I do, uh, I, I just think it's the idea would be not to compete but try to add. So if, if you find an issue in which a journalism outlet may need to not just have one perspective from one particular line. Try to figure out what it is that, that the competitor is adding to the dimension of understanding and then try to augment. But, but maybe you've got something fresh or interesting so that it's not redundant, but that you're not, you know, you're not trying to shout them down. Also, um, some, of the, some of the big fish, uh, they they're going to stumble and be lazy and whatever. So I think just try to, you know, lick your wounds and move on. And, and, and don't give up and don't get hostile about it. Uh, maybe this is a place to close, which is the business is changing. The news business yeah. is changing. The economics of the news business, the business plan, I hear people say to me, doesn't make sense anymore. Um, which I suppose makes sense, right? I mean, a lot of, uh, particularly in, the, in the, the print news business, 
you were going to run a printing press anyway on a Thursday afternoon. Yeah. If it meant throwing up an extra page for Macy's to talk about their white sale around Labor Day or whatever it was, that was found money, right? right. And it helped to underwrite the political reporting, the international desks and whatever else. That's changing. Yes. What does that feel like for someone who's practicing this craft right now? It's ugly. It's, ter it's, it's really, uh, it's experimentation with no set ending. And uh, there, in the news business everywhere, there is a feeling that there's a resurgence uh, of interest, public interest, in mm -hmm. what's going on. Well, at times it seemed like an there's explosion in the explosion number of, of uh, subscriptions, uh, right? Of subscriptions, and people are willing to pay for digital content, which is terrific. But at the same time, we've seen nervousness among advertisers. The traditional forms of the financial underpinnings for news organizations uh, it is not the case that a Washington Post or a New York Times can sustain themselves on digital subscriptions, even as that is increasing. Uh, Wall Street Journal, even if that is increasing, you still need a mix of financial resources. And that's why you're seeing news organizations experimenting with taking um, philanthropic, philanthropic uh, contributions to have money in certain projects to experiment with certain things or have partnerships. There's more partnerships. The Rockefeller Foundation did this with The Guardian. They set up a city's desk. It obviously yes. aligned with a lot of Rockefeller's yeah. work, but they kept editorial control, yeah. resided with The Guardian. But Rockefeller had a reliable resource that was covering an issue that was near and dear to their hearts, even if they didn't necessarily have to say in yes. what was being covered. Yeah, so there's a lot of experimentation. Kaiser Health News, for instance, has mm -hmm. a wonderful reputation for the experts. Uh, and the terrific journalists they attract. It's, it's uh, true in a lot of other outlets where it's not just, it, it's straight journalism, but it, it, it ha it's trying to fill a vacuum, right? So I, I don't know where it's all going, but I know, that, uh, I know that many more news organizations are attentive to the idea uh, of whether the cost that they're incurring to produce the news is offset by what it is that they're bringing in in the way of revenues. And uh, they're turning to billionaires. Jeff Bezos at the Post. Jeff Bezos. Uh, they're turning to foundations. They're turning to underwriters, corporate underwriters, and they're willing to experiment with that. Uh, the New York Times sends their journalists on cruises because they think the brand of the New York Times will fill a cruise ship and you can have experts. This is kind of an old way of bringing in you know, some money. Events. Uh, advertisers, one of the, uh, the dicey things that we're watching is that uh, online digital advertising used to produce a certain amount of revenue and now Google and Facebook's uh, uh, influence over that is, is, is watering down the, the amount of money that you can raise on that. So I don't know where we're going, but it, I, all I tell audiences <coughs> is, is it costs a lot to have a New York Times around the world. It costs a lot to have those experts. So whenever you're looking at your, you know, the, the bill, of, you know, and I do this too, um, and I'm weighing, and you're used to free, um, try to think a little bit about it's worth charging. And I'm sure some of these stakeholders themselves are thinking, um, you know, more about w w uh, whether their content production can bring in a certain amount. I'm sure they're bringing in donor interests or readership in ways that used to be just traditionally journalists. Yeah, when I went to the Center for American Progress, our whole conceit was we wanted to go through traditional media, but we also wanted to invent ways to go over, under, and around it so that we could be a resource for a, a narrow subset of people, but we knew there were some walks out there in the world who would find us valuable as a primary source, not having to necessarily wait for when the issue became salient and, and warranted coverage in the New York Times or National Journal. Or well, and your supporters be. and your donor base are looking for that. Yeah. They're looking for outlets that are, do, are filling the holes or doing their own very artful, almost pseudo-journalistic kind of production, that, you know, video, podcast. They're looking for it. All right, we have gone well over time. I'm incredibly grateful Thank to you, you for great. making the time for this. Great. I think Happy we did a little Halloween, bit of good. Everybody. I hope. Happy Halloween. Yeah, I, I, I Happy promise Halloween. I tricks. had. No tricks. We'll have to do this off camera, but I did get you some M&Ms somewhere. Thank um, you. Thanks, buddy. There they are. Ah, I, thank I you. delivered. All right. Happy Halloween, thank everybody. You. Have a great time. Sorry we didn't wear costumes. Uh, if we do this again next Halloween, maybe we will. All right. All right. Take care. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks so much, buddy. See you, everybody. Oh, you bet.